Hello, viewers. I am Susan Gerbeck. I was an attendee at SciCon 2023 in Las Vegas, Nevada at the Flamingo Hotel, <laughs> put on by the Center for Inquiry. What I am releasing are quick take videos uh, from the conference. I am not a professional videographer. I don't make videos for a living or anything of the sort. I am just an attendee who happened to have her iPhone and I like to record things that happen as they happen. So what you're going to see right now is a quick clip. I walked in a little bit late, but um, one of my personal heroes is Paul Offit, and he is giving a talk called Why So Many COVID Boosters? And this is at nine o'clock on Saturday, October 28th, 2023. This video will be released by the Center for Inquiry, so please go and subscribe to their channel, and it will be done in a professional way. I'm just somebody in the audience who's pointing their iPhone at the screen. If I laugh, then the phone jiggles. I do not have a tripod with me, and if my arms get tired, it may reflect that. Um, sometimes I have a clear shot right at the person on the stage. Other times I'm pointing my camera at the screen. It is what it is. This is an unedited video. I haven't even looked at it before I put it up. I enjoy doing these kinds of things to give people a, a flavor of what the conference is, is like and for my own memory. And in the future, whenever I'm having problems with my memory, I'll be able to come back and look at this over and over again. It'll be a new lecture each time. So. <laughs> You can leave me comments if you'd like in the in uh, under this video. But what you're about to see is Paul Offit talking about why so many boosters. And as I said, this is an unedited video. I am not a professional. This is just for fun. Um, subscribe and hit the alert button for Center for Inquiry. And they will release the videos professionally done over time, usually starting in January 2024. And then they will, you know, maybe do one every few weeks and release those. And they will be nice and professional. Then you can ignore mine. But for the moment, I um, have this here for you. Hopefully, I will meet you at a future conference. And please enjoy. <laughs> The second, I think, was that we have confused the public about the need for booster dosing. I really think if you ask people in this audience, um, what does it mean to be fully protected, you're going to get a lot of different answers, but hopefully I'll try and put this in some perspective for you. I think that the, the start of the confusion about the need for booster dosing occurred on August 18, 2001. So now you're about eight months in to the availability of a vaccine. It occurred when President Biden stood up in front of the American public and said, as of September 20th, essentially one month hence, we, the, the administration, are going to be offering a third dose of this vaccine for everybody over 12, 12, month, 12 uh, um, years of age. Um, this surprised people, and it angered people, because what he had done is he had gone around the FDA, he had gone around the CDC, and simply declared that this is what we were going to do. As a consequence, there were two senior FDA uh, people, uh, Marion Gruber and Phil Krauss, who quit. Um, these were well, certainly they were an integral part of our committee. They were voting members, they were FDA representatives, but they were really angry that this had happened. So this was supposed to be on September the 20th. So on September the 17th, three days before that proposed launch by the Biden administration for this third dose, we met. To, to answer the question, to, to see whether or not we agreed with essentially what the Biden administration had recommended. And we didn't. We voted no. A month later, that went to the CDC and their advisory committee on immunization practice who voted no. So now people are confused. Here you have the administration saying you need a third dose, and then you have basically two advisory committees at the FDA and CDC saying no, you don't. Okay, so one year after vaccines were available, uh, protection against severe disease was still holding up. So really, it still supported the notion that two doses were enough to protect you against severe disease. And that was based on 
a study by Mark Tenford and co-workers that came out of the CDC. So now you're a year into a vaccine, a year into the availability of a vaccine. And what he did was he did a study of the protection against hospitalization, which is key, in 8,000 immunocompetent adults between March and December of 2021. So this is largely during a, a, a time when Delta variant was predominant who had received two doses of vaccine versus those who were unvaccinated. The median age was 16, so it was older group. 81% had more than one medical condition, and as I said, Delta was predominant. But if you look overall, uh, protection was holding up for, for uh, against severe disease, independent of whether it was Pfizer's vaccine or Moderna's vaccine, or whether it was a younger age group or an older age group, protection still was for the most part holding up against severe disease. So this, the, the, the recommendation then by the Biden administration really wasn't supported by the CDC's data. And again, the immunological studies supported those epidemiological observations because protection, because uh, the frequencies of these memory cells were still high. This is critical. How long do memory cells last? Because the memory cells are critical for protection against severe disease. Actually, the most important memory cell is not memory B cells or memory T helper cells. It's actually memory cytotoxic T cells. If you look at people who, for example, have been vaccinated, or been naturally infected, or both, who are then are exposed to this virus, you will see the virus then, virus load increase and then come down again. What effector function most correlates with that decrease? It's actually cytotoxic T cells. And I'll explain a little more about that later, but we never talk about them. We never talk about T cells. All we ever talk about are antibodies and that is limiting because this is, uh, it just focuses on one arm of the immune system. Okay, in any case, so and, and we, and both our committees, both the FDA advisory committee and the CDC advisory committee always make a case, let's have T cell people present. Uh, people like Danielle Weisbach at, uh, or, or Alessandro Setti at, at uh, Scripps or, or Shane Crowdy at, at, um, at UCAL San Diego or John Murray at Penn or others who, who publish extensively on T-cells and, and tell you just what I told you, which is T-cells are critical in memory T-cells in protection against severe disease. It's not just about antibodies. Okay. Then the pandemic enters into phase. So at the end of, of 2021, now you're a year into this vaccine, Omicron entered the country and took over, as you can see in sort of purple there. Omicron was different. This virus had a critical number of mutations in the receptor binding domain. So, there's, so we're talking about the fusion protein, the surface protein of the virus, the receptor binding domain on that fusion protein, and this, all the vaccines are made to uh, include that fusion protein. Um, the receptor binding domain is kind of the business end of that molecule. That's the part that binds to cells. Um, and so now you have all these um, mutations or changes on that receptor binding domain. And as a consequence, what's happened now and you've seen this paper by um, David Ho out of Columbia, that there was striking antibody evasion manifested by this variant. But the key word here is antibody. Antibody evasion. And I'll get to that. But because of mutations in the receptor binding domain and the spike protein, vaccination of previous infection offered little protection against mild disease because antibodies were critical in protection against mild disease. And this variant and all the variants that have followed, all still in the Omicron era, um, are, are, have basically resisted that protection by antibodies, at least from the vaccination from the Wuhan strain. It's interesting that, you know, initially you had Wuhan 1, right? And then the first, the Wuhan 1 actually wasn't the virus that left China. The virus that left China was the first variant. It was called, didn't have a Greek letter designation, it was called B614G. That was replaced by Alpha, that was replaced by Delta, and then now, end of 2021, you have Omicron. It's been Omicron ever since. We've had two years of Omicron, the Omicron variants. I keep waiting for somebody to publish an article called, Where is Pi? Because <laughs> <laughs> but importantly, in otherwise healthy people, vaccination of previous infection still prevented, again, prevented severe disease. So even if you'd only gotten the Wuhan 1 strain, or you were infected with the, with the original variant, or the, the alpha variant, or the delta variant, uh, you were still protected against serious disease, as is shown here in the study um, that came out of South Africa, which is where at least this virus was first um, detected. Why? Why is it that Omicron, although it escaped recognition by, by antibodies, you, why were you still protected? against severe disease, because that's what happened in this country. When Omicron came in, you saw a dramatic increase in cases. 
but we didn't see nearly that dramatic increase in hospitalizations and deaths because people still, for the most part, who'd been vac vaccinated or naturally infected or both, were still protecting against severe disease. And the reason is, is that those, those sites recognized by T cells remain conserved. So whether you're talking about Wuhan 1 up to the current variants like EG5 or VA286, there's still 70 to 80% conservation of those T cell epitopes. And that's good news. Uh, the, 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 um, the, the term that's been used by Dan Brook, who's a um, Harvard immunologist, he, he calls T cells the unsung hero of this pandemic. I think that's a good idea. In any case, with Omicron coming into the United States, that led to the birth of the first booster dose. And so this, these were studies that were done by the CDC and others showing that, that if you got a third dose, you had a lesser chance of being hospitalized than if you had only had two doses. Similarly, if you look at the second dose, and the, the numbers were much smaller here, if you look at the lower right-hand corner, people vaccinated with one booster dose had four times the risk of dying from COVID compared with those who got a greater than or equal to two booster doses. So in the Omicron era then, this, this booster, whether it was a third booster, fourth booster, did keep people out of the hospital. But the point is, is it wasn't everybody who was being kept out of the hospital. There were really certain high-risk groups. This is a paper by Watkins and coworkers again out of the CDC trying to answer the question, who did these booster doses protect? Did they protect everybody, or did they protect just certain high-risk groups? And the answer was, it was really just primarily certain high-risk groups. People who were elderly, but had trouble using that. I, I define elderly, by the way, as greater than 75, just so we're clear, okay? <laughs> you're, you're welcome. Um, uh, people who were in long-term care facility residents, which is synonymous, people, and people who were being compromised, people who had uh, comorbidities, often more than one comorbidity, diabetes, obesity, um, a chronic lung disease, chronic heart disease, and, uh, and, and, and people who were pregnant. But those were the people who, who clearly were at highest risk, who, whose underlying conditions put them at highest risk of hospitalization, who now benefited from this additional dose. I, I do think in the end, this was a three-dose vaccine because you did need at least four months or so difference between um, two doses to really get kind of long-lived memory response. It's true for a number of other purified protein vaccines like the hepatitis B vaccine, human papillomavirus vaccine, those are, are multi-dose vaccines where you need a separation of about four months. So I think in the end, as the dust settled, this was a three-dose vaccine. Okay, the third, the third thing that I think was probably the hardest for us, and I think this was when you started to not only have some loss of trust in the general population, but have some loss of trust with the scientific community was the bivalent vaccine experience. So, on June 28, 2022, our committee sat down to discuss what to do about this vaccine, how to construct this vaccine. So here, up to this point, we'd only been using that original strain, right, the Wuhan 1 strain. But now you have Omicron in this country, this immunovasive strain. Would it make sense then to include the, this Omicron strain in a vaccine? So that was the thing. It was, it was kind of a first step. Let's take a step away from Wuhan, but not with both people. Let's have a half of the bivalent vaccine will have a half a dose of Wuhan and a half a dose of one of the Omicron strains. That was the thing. And so at the time when that decision was made, which was early 2022, the predominant circulating virus was BA1. Now, by the time we sat down, BA1 was gone. And so, so the decision then was, okay, we'll do BA4, BA5. We'll do that vaccine. And so, uh, now, there were no human data for BA4, BA5. Um, there, were, there were mouse data, but there weren't human data. And, and David Weiner, who's a uh, vaccinologist at uh, Penn, I think says it best, mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. <laughs> <laughs> we really need human data. So we just have some, absent any human data, um, we launched essentially a bivalent vaccine program that had Half a dose of Wuhan 1, half a dose BA4, BA5. So the day after we met, so this is obviously something that had already been decided, um, the, the Biden administration bought 105 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine, still no human data. Um, a month after that, they bought a, uh, an additional 66 million doses of Moderna's vaccine, so now the government has purchased 171 million doses of this bivalent vaccine. Still no human data. 
And I'm talking about immunogenicity data. I'm not talking about clinical data, just immunogenicity. Is, is it true that when you have this BA4, BA5 containing vaccine, that you get a better neutralizing antibody response against BA4, BA5 than if you just got the high monovalent vaccine? Is this a better vaccine? Um, a month and a half after that, the, um, the vaccine was, um, was, was also uh, recommended for those over five years of age. So, and, and, and that's what happened. I mean, the people like the Shisha, who was the, um, the, um, the COVID response coordinator for the, for the, uh, for the White House, would, would be on national television, and he would say, this is a better vaccine. It's much better. It's dramatically better. But at this point, there still were no human data. It wasn't until the end of October 2022, about four months after the purchase of these 171 million doses of this BA4, BA5 containing bivalent vaccine, that the first human data were published. They were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was a paper out of uh, David Ho's lab uh, at Columbia, where what he did was he found, if you look at sort of the right-hand portion of this slide, there were no differences in the titers of BA4, BA5 specific neutralizing antibodies after boosting with the bivalent versus monovalent vaccine. It wasn't any worse, it just wasn't any better. Similarly, a paper by Dan Baruch out of Harvard, uh, published in the same journal, um, showed, again, that there were no differences in the title of ba 5 specific neutralizing antibodies after boosting with a bivalent versus monovalent vaccine. There was one clinical study done in this country looking at the ba one bivalent vaccine compared to monovalent, clinical, meaning were you less likely to get severe illness or even any illness? No, same thing. There was also a study done in the UK with clinical, looking at clinical disease, no difference. And then there was one study done looking at BA4, BA5, which was done in France, which showed, um, again, in participants greater than 60 years of age who received either the monovalent or bivalent vaccine. In a prospective randomized study of 136,000 people followed for about two months, there was about an 8% increase in protection uh, against symptomatic illness, which was not a statistically significant increase. And th this, was, uh, this was hard for us. I think this was hard for us as scientists because what you saw was you saw a, um, a public health community that was continuing to stand up and say it's better. And it, this, this, for me, I, um, I had written a perspective piece in the New England Journal of Medicine that was published um, around the same time, or at the same time that the, uh, the Ho and Boop studies were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And that, that meant that, because I was occasionally on uh, television associated with this pandemic, because I was on the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee. Um, so I wound up being on, on TV to, to discuss this, because I had had that, um, that article in, um, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And so what, I remember it was Pamela Brown, I'll never forget this magic moment, and I'm not having a magic moment during this pandemic, but the, um, so, so what Pamela Brown did on CNN was she showed a clip of Ashish Jha saying, this is dramatically better. You need to get it because it's dramatically better. And then she sort of shifted to me and she said, so, is he wrong? You know, it, it's, so you don't, first of all, you never, never contra contradict him. It's really not about him. It doesn't matter what he says any more than it matters what I say. The only thing that matters is what did the data show, and so, which was my answer. My answer was, um, that the, there were two studies published in the Journal of Medicine, here's what they showed, but boosters boost, and this, this us also boosts, it's just not better than what we had. And, and when you do that, when you um, counter or challenge the science behind a public health recommendation, you get hammered, you do, because we're living in a very divided time right now. I mean, um, the minute you show any sort of um, pushback on the science behind the recommendation, um, you get hammered by the public health community because you've now gotten off the bus. I mean, you're either on the bus or you're off the bus. And you know, I, I was, uh, I got a lot of, you know that you're, you know you're not getting your message across when you get love letters from anti-vaccine activists. <laughs> uh, saying things like they've been praying for you and your family for years and finally their prayer has been answered. <laughs> or you're asked to speak on Newsmax. Newsmax. I know you've seen Newsmax, but it's like a Saturday Night Live, live parody of a conservative news. <laughs> it's bad. Suddenly you're on you're on a, a show with Rudy Giuliani. It's, it's not uh. good. okay. Um, the last reason, as uh, I think, um, what we've done is we have kind of now likened SARS-CoV-2 virus to influenza virus, and therefore last year we recommend we the United States recommended. 
uh, a, a bivalve booster for everybody over six months of age. This year, we've made the same recommendation. Um, now, we're in a different stage of this pandemic. There, there is, um, we're going to learn a lot this winter. You have a very high level of population immunity in the high 90% range. Most people have been vaccinated or naturally infected. And in fact, most people have been both vaccinated and naturally infected, which provides so-called hybrid immunity, which is to have the longest lasting, broadest immunity. And so as a consequence, you've seen a clear decline in, in, uh, in hospitalizations and deaths. And so um, yeah. on June 15th, then, our vaccine advisory committee met to discuss um, the next vaccine, <laughs> this year's vaccine. Because we do that every year with influenza vaccine. Every year, um, our committee sits down in March. We uh, look at strains of influenza that, that are circulating throughout the world. And then we pick the strains that we think are going to be coming into this country. Um, and we're usually right. Um, it's a six-month production cycle, so you meet in March for a September rollout. Um, you're usually right, but you're not always right. And, and so we were wrong three times in the past 20 years, all on one particular strain, so-called H3N2. When you miss the flu, a miss is a mile. If, if you look at protection in those years against that virus, when people got the vaccine and then were exposed to that virus, they had very little protection. It depends on what study you looked at. It's one study was 6%, one study was 20% protection against severe disease. So it's a very strange specific phenomenon, influenza. I know when people sort of see us miss, they think that, that, that you actually should watch these meetings. It, it is amazing. I mean, it's presentations by the Department of Defense, the CDC, the World Health Organization. Um, it's, we really do try and get this right. Um, you, you're, you're seeing all these clays and subclays that are sort of moving and um, I think when we miss, people think we're just sitting around with like sock puppets and a magic eight ball, but that's <laughs> not true. We actually take this all seriously. Um, but I, I actually studied in a flu lab back in the 1980s at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia, and the guy who was the head of that lab, a man named Walter Gerhardt, said something to me I'll never forget because it's true. He said, if you want a research career that lasts the rest of your life, study influenza. Absolutely. This virus is a moving target. Not only does it, does it mutate year to year or evolve year to year, it evolves during the season. I mean, this is why this vaccine at its best is 60% effective. It evolves during a natural infection. That virus continues to evolve even during a an infection. That's why it's so hard. But in any case, the, um, the, the, the vaccine that we picked was the so-called um, XBB15 strain because it, it sort of was representative of the circulating strains. And then the CDC recommended that for everybody over six months of age. The, 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 what I regretted here a little bit was that I think we should have at least had a discussion about some a different recommendation because the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Australia, and the World Health Organization all recommended targeting high-risk groups. Um, regarding vaccinating healthy young people, the World Health Organization has stated that, quote, although additional booster doses are safe for this group, we do not routinely recommend them given the comparatively low public health returns. So what's the most recent evidence then of who's getting hospitalized and who's dying? Because that's what you want to know. Because then that's the group that I think you need to focus on. So this is just up through August of 2023. Adults over 65 accounted for 63% of all COVID hospitalizations and 88% of deaths. Although about 95% of Americans over 65 have been vaccinated, 42% of those hospitalized had never been vaccinated, which is amazing. So that 5% that wasn't vaccinated is now disproportionately represented in a hospitalized group. Only 23% have received a booster dose. About 99% of elderly adults hospitalized had at least one high-risk medical condition, and 90% had two or more. Um, the high-risk conditions are shown there. The, the, the other point is that um, the group most likely to be hospitalized, the age group most likely to be hospitalized are those over 75, right? What's elderly? Over 75. <laughs> um, the second group most likely to be hospitalized are children less than four. Children are the least vaccinated group. But children less than four are the least of the least vaccinated group. The current immunization rate in children less than four who've been fully vaccinated is 5%. So 95% of children less than four are unvaccinated. And that's not okay. I mean, we really do need to realize that this, this virus is going to be with us for decades, if not longer. And, and when children are born, they're likely to be protected by the passive antibodies from their mother who've been either vaccinated or naturally infected or both. But those antibodies are gone by six months of age. Um, and so we need to make sure they're vaccinated. There's four strains 
of human coronavirus is currently circulating in the United States. Four. They all represent animal to human spillover events, as this virus did as well. This was a spillover event in the western section of the Hunan market in Wuhan um, in late 2019. One of those four strains of human coronavirus that were circulating entered the human population in the late 1700s. The other one entered the late population in the late 1800s. Let's assume this virus is going to be with us for a long time. And by six months of age, antibodies from the mother will have passively, uh, will have uh, uh, been gone. So that six month old needs to be, or people over six months need to be vaccinated. We now, my wife and I was in the back, um, now are, 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 had our first grandchild, or actually our daughter law had our first grandchild. Um, <laughs> and um, so she's now nine months old, and we're working, doing our best to try and make sure she gets vaccinated. I have no influence over people in my family, but we're trying our best. <laughs> okay, so I think uh, right now the, the best strategy is a yearly vaccine for those who are at highest risk. And I think we really do need to figure out uh, for how long that's going to last. I think, you know, it's, it's when I chose to uh, comment to the, the media um, that I thought we should have a targeted recommendation. And there were many in the public health community that didn't like that. And I, I met, uh, I, I know Dr. Patrick well, and we were at a meeting together, or a, a gala together about uh, three weeks ago. And um, I talked to him about this. I said, you know, don't you think it makes sense to sort of have a targeted recommendation? He said, yes. I think that makes the most sense. The problem is, he said, is that when you have a nuanced recommendation, it's a garbled recommendation. And the, the people who are in those high-risk groups are much more likely to get a booster dose if you say the vaccine is recommended for everybody than if you say it's recommended for these groups. Now, now he may be right. I don't know. It's, a, it's certainly a testable hypothesis. Um, but um, I don't know. I, I, the, the, I, think, I just think you have to be honest and say that, that, that you can't say everybody needs to be vaccinated when a healthy young person isn't really going to benefit much from the vaccine. I think, I think for a healthy young person, it's a sort of low risk, low reward. I think you get a few more months of protection against mild disease. But um, I think that I think it's okay to have a nuanced message. There's a, a, a New Yorker cartoon, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's a, a guy, a, a patient sitting on an examining table. The doctor's walking in, you know, the doctor's brow is creased. He's obviously going to be giving him news. And the patient looks at the doctor and says, give it to me, nuance, stop. <laughs> okay, this is my, my last slide. I think, I think the le lesson from the bivalent vaccine adventure, was, which was the best sort of a step to the side, it's okay not to get it right the first time. Just, just you know, you can, you can say that. It's okay to say that. I think that we need to trust the American public to understand that we do learn as we go. I mean, you have to learn as you go. You always, you, always, you never get it right exactly the first time. That, that, it, that that's the scientific process. I mean, in many ways, that's what's beauty, the beauty of science, is that I think it, uh, you don't lock yourself into an unshakable belief, but rather you're always evolving, self-critical, introspective. I mean, I remember as a, as, wait, one second, I'll, I'll ask, answer your question there. Um, I think that, um, I mean, as, as a scientist, trained as a scientist, um, I worked on road virus for 25 years, and, and when I would, I would present studies at a national, international meeting, what I, I wanted was criticism. I wanted, because I, I drew certain conclusions based on my data. What was, was were those conclusions fair? Um, was, was my, did I do the right controls? Was it internally consistent, robust, reproducible? You wanted that, that feedback, because that's the only way your science got better. And I feel the same way here, but it just doesn't work as well in a public health situation, when you sort of challenge the science behind public health recommendations, especially uh, openly because I think there's pushback, especially in these divided times. Okay, so I will stop right there, and thanks for your attention.